I want to tell you about my secret fantasy life. In this life, I direct and produce dramatic films in exotic locations around the world. In this fantasy life, I work with a dedicated group of cast and crew and make these movies in exotic locations like Beijing, Rome, Paris, Istanbul, Singapore, Hong Kong, Cambodia, Burma, sorry, Cambodia, Burma, and even exotic Canada. But the thing about this fantasy life is it's actually not a fantasy at all. It's absolutely true. And the people who have made this dream come true are my kids. But before I get into that story, let me tell you another story, and it's about my introduction to filmmaking. This is video, it's actually film, that my grandfather shot. Growing up, he would record our family life with his Super 8 camera. You guys probably remember those. And over the years, these images became the visual memory of my childhood. Now, Gramps was not a great shooter, but he was fearless and he was consistent. He would shoot anyone and he would shoot anything, and he panned way too much. <laughs> you can see there. But I'm really glad he shot those films, because they're a real special memory of my childhood. And then a few years later, something happened. My dad came home from the college where he worked, with a borrowed video camera, and the video age had arrived. And my sister and my brother and I we couldn't believe it, because suddenly we could get behind the camera. Suddenly we could make our own stories, we could make our own movies. And so we did what any kid would do in North America in the 1980s. We made music videos. <laughs> and here's one starring me. I worked out for weeks ahead of time. My sister, my sister was very proud of the scar on the side of my face. Thank you. My wife told me not to show that video, for the record. Now, I did not grow up to be a music video director, nor did I grow up to be a boxer. Instead, I became a video journalist for CBC Television in Canada, and as a video journalist, I worked in the space between news and documentary, and I made movies of a different kind. And those of us in that space often wonder what it's like in the glamorous world of invented reality, of fiction films, of Hollywood. And one day I thought it would be fun to cross that line and to live out my fantasy of being a Hollywood director. But I'm an impatient person, as many of you know, and I thought, how can I do this? How can I live out this fantasy without spending 20 years in the trenches as an assistant, 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 third director? What resources do I already have that I can leverage? Well, I worked for the CBC. I had a video camera I could borrow on the weekends. I had a laptop, which I could edit with. And I had my kids. And these kids were not only not unionized, <laughs> but they were totally free. So we set about making some films, and I thought back as we did this to those videos, those films that my grandfather shot when I was a kid. There's poorly shot, grainy footage. And if we're totally honest, they're kind of boring. You can only watch them for so long. Certainly, non-family members can never watch them. I made that mistake one time. I showed them to a girlfriend, and needless to say, that relationship did not pan out. <laughs> there was another problem. The kids were never more than objects for the camera. They weren't active participants in the filmmaking or the story. So I envisioned, I envisioned films of a different kind, family movies of a different kind, something more collaborative, something perhaps a little uncommon. So I set about making a dramatic film with my kids. Uh, my boys at the time, my stepson was 10 and my twins were 5, so the 10-year-old already knew enough to stay far away from any such project. But the five-year-olds were game, and they were especially game when I told them that the subject of our first film was going to be something near and dear to their hearts. Five-year-old boys, sword fighting. And the film was called Bad Guys Are Bad. It was just over a minute, and here's the last 20 seconds. I'm going to get you. You're never going to get me. Bad guys are 
guys are bad. So I knew this would not be the last film. Thank you. We, we shot that in an afternoon, and I knew it wouldn't be the last film. When in that last scene, as the director, I instructed Austin, when he died, when he was fatally wounded, that he should close his eyes. And he told me, he said, Dad, don't close your eyes when you die. Come on. Not only a stickler for realism, but also an engaged, active participant in the story and in the filmmaking. So then we set into a trailer phase. We made some trailers. We made a uh, Little Banker, starring Miles. Uh, the financial thriller, <laughs> because he's into money. Uh, and we made Little Chef, starring Austin, because he's into cooking. So here's uh, a cut-down version of Little, Little Chef. In a world of fast food, he was a simple soup chef. But trouble moved into the city. They took his celery. They took his onion. They even took his fennel. But when they tried to take his carrots, they went too far. <laughs> this spring, Pedro Pared Productions presents the world's smallest and newest kung fu master, Little Chef. That was Little Chef. Thank you. So then, so then we moved to Asia. And moving to Asia had nothing to do with our filmmaking ambitions, but more about wanting to take our kids and go out and see the world. But it happened to be a happy coincidence for our filmmaking ambitions, because suddenly we realized we we're going to be in some pretty cool locations over the next little while, and that airport transfers and airport layovers and tourist sites could become our film sets. So China was our first stop, and we set about making our first overseas production. It was called Digging, and uh, it was just over five minutes long, critically acclaimed from the grandparents. <laughs> they loved it. And I edited a one-minute version for today. What do you want to do then? Go dig a hole in China. The film, the film starts in Canada. This film, this film was a turning point for us. Uh, one, we realized it's much harder than you think to find a manhole in central Beijing to climb out of. <laughs> really tricky. Two, our 10-year-old, who is now 12, decided that being in our movies was actually an okay thing to do. And three, pretty much from then on, whenever we travel, we make a film. So we made a bunch more. Uh, some of the highlights have been we made Up the River, which was an action adventure set in, in Borneo, here in Indonesia. We made a film called The Search for the Golden Wedge, shot in France, Italy, and Indonesia. And it was an epic co-production with uh, friends of ours living in Rome. I will not tell you if they find the Golden Wedge. You have to watch the film yourself. And we are currently in post-production on The Red Balloon, which is our most ambitious film yet. Hopefully will come out this summer, shot, shot across three continents. So you're probably asking yourselves, why are we doing this? Why are we still making these films? Why do we make these films? And I think we do it for a bunch of reasons. 
One, it's been a really fun way for me to engage with my kids. Making films together has been, and it might sound cheesy, it's been quality family time. We've, we've kind of bonded over a common project and a common goal. Two, I think the kids have learned a lot, and not only about filmmaking, not only the hard skills in filmmaking, like shooting and editing and acting, but also soft skills like problem solving and communicating and figuring out you know, how to get things done and how to do things. The boys have wooed a Stern Cafe owner in Istanbul to let her use her cafe for a film set. And they figured out how to shoot in Tiananmen Square without getting busted by the authorities. <laughs> These are important skills. Three, I think um, making films together has made our travel experiences richer and more rewarding. You know, when you're nine years old, visiting temples for three days in a row, totally boring. When you're nine years old, shooting an action adventure in the middle of an 11th century shrine, totally awesome. Um, recently, we were in Burma. That last picture w uh, was up was from Burma. And we were heading home at the end of a long day. And we were in the back of the car. And we passed the temple. And we stopped. And we had this, this, this discussion. Should we go and visit this temple? And the deciding factor was we were making a film. We needed another great shot. Let's do it. So we ran through the desert, climbed up this temple, and we were the only ones there. And there was these little staircases. And we got up to the top. And it was amazing. And it was magical. And it was all because we were making a movie. And we were extra motivated to get that shot. Now it is true, sometimes, I will admit, that I'm a little more extra motivated than the kids. <laughs> and I have, I have on occasion, once or twice, heard myself say, if you're not de dedicated to this project, I could find someone else. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Now the kids know very well uh, that it's not true. <laughs> that I've never directed anyone else but them and their friends. Um, and so we figure it out and we move on. One person I should mention is my wife, who kind of acts as an executive producer on our project. She manages the budget. Uh, she's in charge of intercontinental wardrobe continuity. <laughs> and, and she keeps the director under control. So if I'm pushing for one more shot, she'll step in and she'll say, enough, let's go for dinner. Now, I should mention that in that car in Burma at the end of the day, she was not with us. She was, she was off getting a massage. I think most importantly, what making these films has done and what it's taught me and what it's taught my kids is that movies and stories are not just something to be consumed, but they are a creative process that we can all take part in. It means my kids don't watch movies the same way anymore. Now when we're watching a film at home, Austin will say, wow, great shot. And Miles might say, hey, how'd they do that? And we'll rewind it and we'll watch it again from a filmmaker's perspective. And they've also started to co-direct the films. Recently, when we were shooting in that cafe in Istanbul, Austin took over. And he told me where I should stand and how I should pan like this. And most importantly, and most crazy from my perspective, that I should go inside the cafe and shoot out instead of outside the cafe shooting in, which is a way more interesting and creative shot than what I was planning. So in an age when kids can download any film at the click of a mouse, becoming a content creator changes that equation. It makes them maybe double think it. It makes them maybe not take films and stories for granted. You know, nowadays in the schools, we're really emphasizing still reading and writing. And those are important. Those are important. But alongside those, those things, kids should be learning how to tell stories through moving pictures, whether they're fiction or whether they're documentary. It's a language, and we need to learn and we need to learn it, and we need to teach it to our kids. You know, nowadays, many of us are not able to produce films and videos. And so we're consumers. We're just taking it in. Something like NIDA, I've heard 95%, 96%, 97% of us can't produce films and videos. And yet video is everywhere. Imagine if 95% of us who could read couldn't write. There'd be a revolution. I know what some of you are thinking, making films, making stories like this, it's difficult. You need special gear, you need special equipment, you need special skills. Well, you don't. You don't. That might have been true 10 years ago, but it's not true anymore. That smartphone in your pocket shoots images that are 30 times more powerful than the film that my grandfather was shooting 30 years ago. And that smartphone will even mimic my, my grandfather's camera if you want it to. 
There's an iPhone app for that. So I think um, no matter what you make, whether and no matter the quality of it, you already have uh, an international network interested. YouTube will put up whatever you want. You know, I really believe that filmmaking and storytelling is too much fun and too important to be left to the experts and the Hollywood studio. So I think we need to realize that our stories are worth telling, that our stories are worth sharing, and that our stories are worth making. Being a filmmaker does not need to be a secret fantasy. Thank you.